no problem at all. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's an honor to be asked to speak to you and your students. Um, and thank you to all the students who've come to the talk today. I hope you find it interesting. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my slides. So, hopefully you are seeing some slides and hopefully these slides are now in presentation mode. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is I can't see any of you. I realize most of you have your cameras off and for the people in the room, I can't see you at all. So, um, I used to be a lecturer, I used to teach a lot, and honestly, it's quite nice when you can see a room full of students, and if they look really confused, you can see their faces, and you can stop and, you know, ask and have a conversation. Um, because we do this online, I obviously can't do that. So if you are feeling really, really confused, um, or something's just not very clear, or you just have a burning question, please interrupt me. Um, I'm very happy for you, if you're online, to take yourself off mute, and you know ask me a question um i understand you can also post stuff in the chat and the facilitators can then you know read your question out if that's what you'd prefer um but please don't sit here feeling silently confused and feeling too shy to interrupt um i'd much rather you stop me and we can we can have a conversation um i should also say as i talk i'll also kind of hopefully have some break moments where i'll ask if you have questions but of course if you prefer we can also leave questions till the end it's just a little bit of the kind of online lecture admin um yeah so as christina said i'm going to speak to you about the impacts um, that fiction may have on the ways that we think critically this was my phd research project um so to give you a little bit of a sense i suppose of who i am why I was doing this research, what I'm doing now. Um, I am currently a researcher at the Institute for Community Studies. Um, we are part of a charity. We're part of the Young Foundation. So we're a non-profit independent research institute. We do all kinds of different research projects commissioned by different organizations, institutions, funders, um, under the sort of big old umbrella of community studies, which is very broad. Um, and I guess roughly most of our research tries to influence policy making in some way. Um, you know, my work within the Institute of Community Studies has looked at things like how do we make the research system more fair and more accessible and equ equitable for different communities? So I've done some work on that. Um, and I've been on a research project lately looking at social infrastructure and what that might mean. And that work has included libraries. So I'm not, you know, working as a librarian anymore. I'm not in a library information studies sort of department, um, but I haven't completely left that world behind. I think libraries will always have an important place in my heart and in my research, I hope. Um, and just to note here, you know, if any of you are interested in my research at the Institute, please ask that question at the end and I can always tell you a little bit more about it if that's something that interests you. Um, again, as Christina said, I used to be an academic librarian. Um, I worked at a couple of different places. I've noted here Regent University in London, um, where I sort of ran the library service. I was a subject librarian for quite a number of subjects. It's a small university, but has a very nice library, actually. Um, so I do have that kind of practical experience. Um, I spent a long, long time teaching all kinds of students about research methods. Um, so if you're interested in methodological conversation, please ask me those questions. I'm a massive methods nerd, so I'll be very happy to talk about it. And, you know, as a, having you know been a student myself, I started out my bachelor's degree was in philosophy. I then got into cognitive science for a master's degree. Then I moved into library and information. So that, sorry, library and information studies. Um, and ultimately, that's what I did my PhD in. So that's sort of a little bit of the who am I. Um, I will quickly note here, by the way, just so you know, I do speak Czech. If you want to ask me questions in Czech, I'm comfortable with that and I can understand them. But I've lived my whole life in the UK. I don't have a lot of practice for my Czech. So my spoken Czech is pretty terrible. Um, so I can understand you very well. I might answer in English. Uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed about how bad my check is, but anyway, just so you know. So 
I then got into this PhD research project um, essentially because I guess having studied philosophy, having been interested in cognitive science and psychology, I had all these ideas that I thought I could connect to the world of library and information studies. Um, and I was speaking to who was initially my supervisor, Dr. Charlie Inskip, who works at UCL, University College London, I should say. Um, and he encouraged me and I put in a proposal. So um, I don't know, actually, I don't really know how this works in the Czech Republic. So maybe later you can tell me, but in the UK, either there's a PhD project that has already been designed and you apply to do it kind of in the way you would apply to do a job, I suppose, um, but it's designed by the supervisor, or you can propose your own project. Um, and there's sort of just different ways of getting into PhD research. So this was a project that I designed and I proposed myself. Uh, I was accepted, luckily, to do that at UCL. That's one of the lovely libraries that UCL has. They have many libraries. Um, and I was in the Department of Information Studies. Again, I'll be really interested to hear how this looks in the Czech Republic, because I think it might be a bit different. But the UCL Department of Information Studies is a little bit of a different department anyway in the kind of British context because it combines um, librarianship, archiving, but also publishing, digital humanities, um, yeah, and a kind of odd sort of bit of computer science as well. So it is inherently a really interdisciplinary department. And the reason I'm highlighting that is that my PhD was quite interdisciplinary. Um, and I think it's probably quite non-traditional for maybe other information studies departments. Um, but anyway, it, within the UCL context, I had the freedom to be really flexible, I think, about how I approached it. And that was that was for me a real benefit. Um, and just so you're aware, there's a little timeline here. Um, but essentially, I finished uh, my PhD at the start of 2022 um, and have obviously since been working at the Institute for Community Studies. So that's a little bit of context. OK, so today uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. I will try and sort of fit in uh, some small break moments in between these uh, sections in case you've got questions um, but you know that's fine if not we can also have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I'll firstly talk to you sort of about the logic like why would you even research fiction and critical thinking why might these things be connected um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at the beginning. Um, as part of my PhD research I actually ran four studies I'm just going to say up front, if anybody's thinking about doing a PhD, don't do four studies. This was a bad idea. It was too much. But I did that. It is definitely too much for me to talk to you in detail about all four studies today. That would take a really long time. So I'm going to talk to you about, I'll explain all of them, but I'll focus on two. And I won't talk in a huge amount of detail about the other two. But this will make sense once we get going. And at the end, um, I've got some kind of commentary on maybe what I think it means or the kind of impact that I feel this research might have. Um, but hopefully that's also something that we can discuss more broadly because I'm interested to hear what any of you think. OK, so first and foremost, why, you know, fiction and critical thinking? What might the connection be? Um, and here it's kind of, I suppose, a bit of literature review. So I'll explain a little bit of what I was reading, what previous research I was finding, and why that made me think um, maybe this was an interesting area for me to, to do this research in. So I actually did not start talking about critical thinking at all. I started um, looking at information literacy. When I did my Library and Information Studies master's degree, information literacy was really what I was interested in. It was sort of my favorite topic. So that was definitely my starting point here. Um, again, if you're not familiar with the term information literacy, somebody please interrupt because I'm sort of assuming that it, it's commonly used across information studies. Um, but yeah, I'm not actually sure. So please let me know if this is something completely new to you and I can explain it better. 
Um, so on one side of the slide here, we have a definition of what information literacy is, and this is from SILIP, uh, the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, which here in the United Kingdom, that is our professional body for librarians and information professionals. So they say information literacy is the ability to think critically and make balanced judgments about any information we find and use. It empowers us as citizens to reach and express informed views and to engage fully with society. Um, and it struck me that they're talking about the ability to think critically, right? And, uh, you know, on the critical thinking side of things, there's a whole body of literature about critical thinking. What does it mean? Um, this is a really simple quote, but it, it's from, I suppose, I think one of the most widely used definitions. And Robert Ennis, who's quoted here, is, I would say, one of the biggest names in the academic literature about critical thinking. And he thinks that critical thinking is reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding on what to believe and do. Um, and it started making me think like, well, when we talk about information literacy, is it the same as critical thinking? These definitions to me seem to basically be saying the same thing. Um, so I did a bit of literature based research. There's a paper that's published from this. So if this topic interests you, if you want to know more about why I think information literacy and critical thinking overlap, you're very welcome to read the whole paper. But having then gone into a big old literature review reading all these papers about information literacy, all this stuff about critical thinking, it struck me that there's a difference when we talk about the really basic skills. So when we think about the basics of critical thinking, we're often talking about logic. So, you know, if Aristotle is a man and all men are mortal, therefore Aristotle is mortal, right? Like really simple logic. Um, that might be the kind of basics of critical thinking. When we talk about information literacy, I think we have some kind of basic skills which are about, um, you know, honestly, the sort of stuff we sometimes do with with new undergraduate students around what's the difference between a journal article and a newspaper article and why might one be more valid than the other? So I think when we get to the basics, they're different. Um, and the way they're taught, I think, is quite different. But actually, I think in the middle of my little Venn diagram here, when we talk about what information literacy and critical thinking means on a much deeper level, when we talk about, you know, strong sense or like much more rich and complex understandings of what it means to be information literate or what it means to think critically. I think, in my view, we're actually talking about the same thing. Um, and I'm going to be controversial here. In my personal view, it's a little bit of a problem, I think, for the library and information studies world that we are using information literacy, which I don't know how it is in the Czech language, but certainly in English, if I stopped a random person on the street and said to them, hey, what's information literacy? They would have no idea. But critical thinking is a term that really everyone knows. If I stop a random person and say, hi, what's critical thinking? they could give me an answer. I wonder if we're slightly alienating ourselves in the library and information sciences by using, you know, the slightly specialist, slightly strange language of information literacy. But that's a bit of an aside. What it means, though, is with my PhD research, I stopped talking about information literacy. I started talking about critical thinking. And for the rest of the research project and for the rest of this presentation, I am going to talk about critical thinking. I'm not going to talk about information literacy. The reason I'm telling you this background is I think, you know, obviously you are a, an audience of people from library and information science. And I just want to make it clear why I think this is relevant to that field, because I think it links really strongly to information literacy. Anyway, critical thinking is important. I would hope we would all agree with that. Um, Lots and lots of authors have argued that thinking critically is essential to live in democratic free societies. Um, I specifically mentioned Bell Hooks here because I think she's a really interesting figure. And in my reading of the kind of library information world, I know she's quite actually prominently sort of been adopted into library studies, particularly into kind of critical approaches. Um, and she makes an argument that, 
you know, critical thinking is what allows us to change our society and really everyone can think critically, regardless of, you know, your gender, your ethnicity or anything else about you, we can all think critically. Um, and therefore, you know, we can use that process to probably, ch you know, change the world, shape the society around us. Um, and obviously more recent kind of discourse around the whole fake news phenomenon and, and everything else, I think have made it really clear that critical thinking is something important and we should care about it. Um, I mentioned, you know, in my little Venn diagram that there might be a kind of basic level of critical thinking, like very logic focused, very if A, then B, therefore C. But when you start reading about critical thinking a little bit more deeply, um, maybe with a little bit more nuance. There's a lot um, of other stuff that is probably needed for us to think critically. So here's a little list of examples. I'm not going to go through them all because I'm conscious that I don't want to spend this whole time just talking to you about definitions. Um, but Barbara Thayer Bacon, who is the first citation here, talks a lot about how thinking critically requires empathy. Because, you know, if someone is making an argument to me, they want to convince me of something, maybe they're telling me I should vote for this politician, or maybe they're telling me I should or shouldn't eat this food or whatever it might be. Of course, I have to think about the content of what they're saying, but I actually also have to be able to empathize with that person and think about what they're feeling and why they might be feeling it. So if you want me to vote for this politician, what's motivating that? Why do you feel that way? Um, yeah, so I think there's something about critical thinking that isn't just cold, logical, let's write down some formulas. Um, there's something there that's interpersonal and it's about understanding each other when we make arguments. Um, you know, to pick another one, I'm just going to pick counterfactual reasoning, which is uh, the burn citation there, just because that's a little bit of an odd piece of language and it might not be obvious what that means. To think counterfactually means to imagine the world otherwise, essentially. <coughs> Sorry. So let's imagine that I'm trying to convince all of you in the room that you should be vegan. Well, if you're trying to evaluate my argument, I think one of the things you'll have to do is try and imagine what would the world look like if we were all vegan? Um, you know, what might be similar? What might be different? What would the consequences be? And how would that play out? Um, so it's a sort of way of imagining an alternative scenario. Sorry, just give me a second. I'm going to drink some more. Apologies for that. Hopefully I've got my voice back. Um, and anyway, there's a whole list of factors here that different authors um, kind of across the range, I suppose, of the critical thinking literature would argue is really, really important for somebody to be a critical thinker or to undertake critical thinking. And so here is where finally you might be thinking she said she was going to talk about fiction. She's not talking about fiction. Here's where I get to an area of the literature that I personally think is fascinating, which is um, a whole range of studies that have shown different outcomes of reading fiction. So these different studies have basically found that people who read more fiction may have more of these kinds of factors. I'm picking empathy because it's probably, I would say maybe the most studied, it's maybe the most sort of famous of these. Lots and lots and lots of studies have connected reading fiction to increased empathy. Um, and I suppose the reasoning that would be that, you know, as you read fiction, you have to understand the experiences and the emotions of the characters in the novel. Um, and by doing that, you're in some way practicing your ability to understand and imagine the emotions and experiences of other people in the real world. I've put one citation here, which is Kid and Castano. It's quite a controversial study, that one, by the way, but there's really a lot of literature that talks about this. And then all the other factors that you might remember from the previous slide come up again. So counterfactual reasoning, what I was just talking about, imagining the world in a different way, has again been connected to reading more fiction. 
And this seems probably quite sensible. Again, you know, if we read lots of novels, what we're doing is we're reading lots and lots of alternative scenarios. It doesn't even have to be science fiction, but that is, of course, maybe an obvious case of this. But, you know, even if I read a Jane Austen novel, I'm imagining the world very differently to the world that I live in now, my experience. Or even a contemporary novel that, you know, set in Afghanistan, let's say, gives me an experience really outside of, of my own reality. So to me, it seemed that I was reading all this literature about critical thinking. I was reading all these things that are required for critical thinking. And then I was seeing all of these studies that suggested fiction might be providing those. So to give you like a really simple model, people who read more fiction seem to increase their empathy. And empathy seems to be something we need in order to be good at critical thinking. Uh, people who read more fiction seem to improve their theory of mind. I'm sorry, this is the technical language used in the field. This means your ability to understand the minds of other people, to guess what another people to guess what another person is thinking, for example. That seems to be connected to critical thinking. Reading more fiction might make us better at imagining different scenarios, imagining the world in different ways to what it is. And that might be important for critical thinking. So this is sort of what I thought might be going on. And that led me to my overarching research question, which was, well, if that's the case, can I show through research, through, through running different studies, that reading fiction is in fact connected um, with critical thinking? So I'm going to do a very brief pause here because I've talked at you a fair amount before I explain the studies I conducted, just to see if anybody's got any questions about this. Um, maybe you've got some questions about the literature, you've got some questions about the logic or the reasoning behind my research. Um, yeah, or anything that I've said so far. I'm just going to give you a minute if you do have a question. So there are no questions in the room. Uh, maybe someone will <laughs> someone will write a question to chat, but so far there's nothing. So okay. Well, maybe yeah. let's let's slowly continue. If a question oh, well. comes through the chat, do interrupt me. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So I told you I ran four studies. If you take nothing else from this, is if you decide to do a PhD, don't do four studies. It's too much, but I think they were interesting. There was a reason why I ran all four of them, obviously, but um, it was a lot. The reason, I suppose, for having multiple studies was partly because I was doing a mixed methods research paradigm. Um, when I say mixed methods, what I mean is um, I was using both quantitative and qualitative research methods. Um, I hope you're familiar with that terminology. Please ask me if you're not. Um, and the reasoning for this is that, you know, let's just take reading. Well, we can quantify reading. We can count how many books we read, for example. Um, but it's also a really personal experience where we go through all sorts of individual different feelings and, and thoughts. And so to me, it seems sort of obvious that there's both something we can measure here, but also there's something really personal we can explore um, through conversation, through interview, you know, through through hearing people's experiences. Um, and, you know, in my view, I suppose as a researcher, I think there's a really interesting interplay when you do quantitative measurement and you do sort of qualitative exploration um, and you bring those two things together. I think you just get more than you would doing either or. So I was very keen to use a quanti uh, to use a mixed methods paradigm to combine quant and qual research. First and foremost, though, I did a pilot study. I'm going to explain this really fast, but just know if you're really interested, the paper is published, you can read it. First and foremost, I was not finding literature that looked at 
fiction reading and critical thinking that I couldn't find studies that already measured these things and tested a relationship. It could be that there's no relationship whatsoever and doing a whole PhD about this is a terrible, terrible idea, right? So I wanted to see, am I, am I crazy? Am I going in a stupid direction? Should I stop and come up with a different question? Or is there a reason to believe that maybe I should be researching this more? I did a really, really simple survey study as a pilot. So literally just some questions in an online form that people can complete, you know, by themselves on the internet in a short period of time. And I can see if there are correlations between things. I looked at two parts of critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking disposition, which is, you know, how much do you want to do try to think critically an epistemological orientation which is a really silly fancy way of saying i guess like what do you believe about truth like do you believe that things are absolutely true and absolutely false do you believe that nothing is ever absolutely true and nothing is completely false or do you believe somewhere in the middle we have to individually evaluate each thing um to measure people's fiction reading, they got an author recognition test. This is a big old list of authors. So you might get Jane Austen, Albert Camus, Phyllis Godley, Sarah Jones, and you have to tick the authors that you know are authors because many people in the list are just random names that are not authors. Um, that's just a quick way of kind of getting a sense of how familiar people are with with uh, fiction and non-fiction authors. Um, so that's kind of what I was measuring. And just to give you, literally, I'm going through this so fast because I'm going to talk about my next study in more detail. But to give you the headline findings, I found that, yes, people who scored better on the author recognition test for fiction, so people who knew more fiction authors, also scored higher for critical thinking disposition. So they seem to be more inclined to think critically. Um, strangely, I suppose, nonfiction was the opposite. Um, and epistemological orientation, sorry, is a little bit tricky, but basically people who recognized more fiction authors um, tended to kind of be more less absolutist. They tended to not believe that things are true or false. I know that I've flown through this really fast, but all this was was a way of me seeing, are there any links here? Basically, the answer was, yeah, OK, there are some links. Um, I'm not going to go through all the limitations out loud because, you know, it's probably not that interesting. But just to make you aware, this was a very basic pilot study. There's not that much you can really conclude. Um, you know, the ART, the author recognition test, as a kind of way of measuring reading definitely isn't perfect. It's a very rough measure. Um, and there might be issues. So with critical thinking disposition, you know, people are saying on a scale of one to five, how much do you like thinking about problems? So it's probably likely that people are ticking five, right? So it's not, this isn't really measuring critical thinking. It's not really measuring reading. Um, and it's only a correlation. We don't know what is causing what. But it gave me a starting point. It made me think, yeah, let's do some more research. OK, so sorry I flew through that so fast, but that's because I want to make sure that I have time to talk to you more about the next two studies. So I'm going to talk to you about my main quantitative study first, which was a reading log, and I'll explain it in a moment. And then I will talk to you about a qualitative study as well, which was about interviews, so that you get a sense, I suppose, of one of each kind of main sort of method. Um, this study, I have to say, I have not yet published. It's been on my to-do list for a year. Um, maybe it's quite nice that I'm giving you a lecture today because it might motivate me to finally write this into a journal article because currently it's just... Um, available in my thesis, which if you really want to read, you can, but that's very long and boring. So anyway, this study was actually really big. I collected a lot of data. 
I did a lot of different kinds of analysis. Um, I'm just making you aware that I'm not covering the whole study with you. I'm going to sort of talk about uh, one main area of the research, um, which isn't super important, but just so that you know that this is part of a bigger, a bigger study. So what this was, was a reading log study with two moments of critical thinking test. What that means is I recruited a load of participants. Um, at the beginning, at T1, they were given a critical thinking test. What this looked like was a short piece of text and then some questions about the text. So the questions were things like, um, what do you think the author's motivations are for writing this text? Um, or, you know, can you summarize the main argument the author is making? So people were asked to analyze what they had read. Um, and then, we had three groups, and this will be explained a bit more in a moment, but there was a group within my participants who were given fiction to read. There was a group who were given some non-fiction to read, and then there was a control group who were given no reading at all. And they were told, you now have two weeks. In this two week period, every single day, you're going to click a link and you're gonna complete a form where you log what you read and how much time you spent reading it. Um, and if you've been given your fiction to read, you're gonna read that. If you've been given nonfiction, you'll read that. And if you're in the control group, all you do is log your reading. You don't, you don't, you don't have to read anything extra. After that two week period, they then did the critical thinking test again, but it was different because it had a different text so that you didn't do the same thing twice because that would obviously just not be a very good test. Um, so essentially it's a test, a period of reading followed by another test. What's important about this particular design is that now we can talk about causation. We can talk about does A cause B, does fiction cause a change in critical thinking? Because we have these measurements. We know how they performed on the test first, we know what they read, and we know how they performed on the test the second time. So we can see if there was a change. And if there was a change, we can see if that's associated to what they read. Um, and another just important note about this design is, it's controlling for people's just normal reading. Because every day they have to like log all the stuff they read. So it could be that if I give you some fiction to read, uh, your normal reading habits are to read five novels a week anyway, right? So you're already reading loads and loads of fiction. Whereas another participant, their normal reading habits might be to never read fiction, but to only read a newspaper. So regardless of what reading I give you and tell you to do for my experiment, there could be enormous differences in just what you would be reading anyway. So that's why everybody had to log what they were reading, because it was important to be able to differentiate between what they read anyway. And did the reading I gave them make any difference? Just to briefly explain the texts, basically some people were given fiction short stories, some people were given non-fiction articles, they were on the same kinds of topics and they were the same kind of length, but I'm not going to go into any detail. If you're interested, you can ask me a question later. So who were these people who agreed to do this? Um, I advertised the study online and primarily in public libraries. Um, I essentially printed a load of posters. I got on my bicycle, I pedaled around London and I put up posters in every public library that would let me um, in North London, basically. So that there's a bit of a geographic kind of um, bubble, I suppose, to who my participants were. And what people then did is they followed the link and they said, yes, I want to take part. And they were asked, are you a fiction or a non-fiction reader primarily? I let people just self decide that. And I asked them some demographics, so stuff like age, educational level, that kind of thing. That meant I had a whole sort of 
spreadsheet of people who said they want to do it. And from that, I was able to use what we call a randomized blocking paradigm. So what that means is I was able to create groups of participants who had similar characteristics, but were different um, for what was important. So what this meant was, for example, educational level for, was something we thought would be important for you know, critical thinking and reading in general. So across my participant groups, we made sure to invite people with the same kinds of education level. So for example, if you were put in the fiction group and you were asked to read some fiction, we made sure that there were people who had kind of only school education. There were some people who had undergraduate degrees. There were some people who had master's degrees, right? So that in each group of participants, those things were roughly the same. So that that way, the only thing that would be different is what we're interested in, which is what they're reading. That's what randomized blocking means. I had a one group of 121 participants. The other really critical thing is I was asking people, are you a nonfiction reader or are you a fiction reader? And the reason I was doing that is I wanted to have some people who normally read fiction being given fiction in my experiment some people who normally read fiction being given non-fiction in my experiment. And again, people who read non-fiction normally, some were given fiction, some were given non-fiction, because that allows me to see if you normally read this material and I give you more of it, does it make a difference? Or if you don't normally read this material, but I give you some, does that make a difference? I realize this might sound a bit complicated, um, if this isn't making sense, please do kind of ask a question because I hope I hope you're following, but it, I realize it's a little bit tricky. So, um, yeah, please interrupt if you need to. What this meant was I had a kind of range of pieces of information that I could then use in my analysis to look for differences. My experimental groups are this list here. So remember, we have a control group. They are not being given anything to read. They're just being told, read whatever you like, log it. Some of them are fiction readers normally, some of them are non-fiction readers. And then exactly as I was saying, we have the fiction group. These are the people who've been given short stories. Some of them normally read fiction, some normally read non-fiction. And the non-fiction group, the, the non-fiction group, sorry, they've been given articles, magazine articles to read. Some are fiction readers, some are non-fiction readers. Now we have the change in critical thinking score. So remember they took two tests. So if we take the score at test time number two, the second test, and we minus time number one, the first test, we can see the change. So if you scored 50 in the first test, and then you scored 65 in the second test, that's 15 points that you have changed. So that's that measure. And then for like how much reading they did, we've got two values here. How many entries did they make in the diary? So remember, they've got an online form and they're asked to fill in. What did you read? And it's like, what was the title? What was the author? How long did you spend reading? So the entry is just title author. This is one thing that they said they've read. And then the time is the minutes. Um, that they say they spent reading. Um, just a point on the entry, you could have many entries for one book, for example. So let's say I'm reading Lord of the Rings. Let's say I read for 30 minutes on Monday. So I open my log, I put in Lord of the Rings, I put in 30 minutes. On Tuesday, I read 45 minutes. I open my log, I put in Lord of the Rings, I put in 45 minutes. That is two entries, just to be clear. So it's just just to make it clear what we're talking about. What that really means is that time is probably the more reliable measure here because time is time, right? Um, but for me, it was interesting to look at both and see if there were differences as well. So this might not be maybe so easy to read because I know the scale at the bottom is very small, but if we just look at a simple correlation in each group, so if you're a fiction reader who's been given nonfiction, if you're a nonfiction reader who's been given fiction, 
how much did your score change from test one to test two? Hopefully what's, what you're seeing is that the green box in the middle is different and the green box in the middle seems to have more change, right? It's higher. That green box is non-fiction readers, people who said, I normally read non-fiction, who've been given some fiction reading to do. Um, that's probably the only one I will comment on here. This is a really simple correlation though. This is just looking at change in score, which group were you in? It's then important to look at remember how much reading did they do because we need to know what is the difference between what you normally read anyway versus the reading I gave you in my experiment. So this regression model here and if you're not familiar with statistics and this doesn't mean anything to you please don't panic I'll just talk you through it briefly. What this tells us is when we control entries, so how many things did people log in their diary? We can see fiction entries has the little stars by the p-value, the, the 0 0.00, that's significant. So how much fiction you read predicted the change in your critical thinking score. But on top of everything you read, on top of the fiction and non-fiction entries you made, being in the non-fiction reader fiction group yeah so people who don't normally read fiction they normally read non-fiction i've given them fiction that predicted a change in critical thinking score when we look at time so that was entries this is time same story right how much time people spent reading fiction in those two weeks predicted a bigger change in their critical thinking score and on top of all the time they spent reading whatever they wanted to read anyway, for the group who normally read nonfiction, but I gave them fiction to read, there was also a significant change in their score. Um, so what this tells us is that if you're normally a nonfiction reader, but I've given you some fiction to read, your score in critical thinking for uh, over that two week period is more likely to change um, than if you're doing any other, if I've given you anything else to read. Hopefully that makes sense. As a tiny caveat though, I started just by looking at change, as in remember score at the second time minus score at the first time. But I realized that some people were actually doing worse at the second time than at the, than at the first time. So maybe they scored 20 at the first test and then maybe they only scored 10 on the second test. So I also looked at just the difference of did you improve or did you not improve? Um, and I'm not going to show you all the results because it's kind of boring, but it, the answer is it's exactly the same. So you see the same result, right? It's basically the people who are non-fiction readers who've been given fiction to read who had an improvement in their critical thinking test score. Um, I'm actually not going to read this paragraph to you, but it's very boring and very long. But it's just saying what I've just said for people who normally say I am a non-fiction reader when they were given some short stories to read over a two-week period their critical thinking score changed and got better um which was kind of exciting for me right that's sort of something I thought we might see and it was great to have that result just to know you know this study like every study has some limitations um it was surprising to me that some people did worse on the second test. I sort of assumed that you would have some practice with the first test. You would know what to expect with the second test and it should be easier. That wasn't the case. Um, there's lots of stuff I didn't measure uh, just because honestly, I didn't want to make participants sit there for like two hours doing a load of tests. Intelligence, mood, you know, there's loads of things that could be playing a role that I did not measure. Um, and one thing that was a bit of a struggle was I had this control group. So remember, there's a group who were given no special reading at all. But 
Strictly speaking, a control group should still be reading. They should be given the same amount of reading. But, you know, what do you give people which is not fiction and it's not nonfiction? Um, I'd actually be interested if anybody's got any ideas because me and my supervisor struggled with this. And lastly, it's really, really important to remember we are looking at two weeks. I did not test these people later. I don't know, you know, how long this effect might last for. Um, I'm not saying that because I gave you five short stories to read, your critical thinking is now better forever. Um, I think that'd be quite unlikely. Um, we're just talking about a two week period and it would be really interesting to do other research to see, um, yeah, other time scales and other sort of time effects. Um, yeah, maybe before I talk about the next study, I'm again just going to do a one minute pause because I know that this has been quite fast. Some of the language might be tricky. If anybody has any questions about this study, about the reading log experiment, um, you can quickly ask me now. But if you'd prefer, you can also leave your questions till the end. That's fine. I'm just going to give you a minute. Well, there is one question in chat. It's about the literature review phase. So I don't know if you want to answer it now or maybe yeah, later. Yeah, maybe. On. Maybe let's do it now before we before we move on. So uh, the question is, what essay or fiction, if any, was most inspiring to you in the literature review phase of your research? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, essay or fiction? Hmm. So maybe as a sort of sort of answer is the fiction author Ursula K. Le Guin, who um, is famous for a range of, of novels, mainly science fiction novels. Um, the Left Hand of Darkness is probably my favorite of hers. Uh, she's also famous for the Earthsea books. Anyway, she's a famous fiction author. Um, she has some essays which have been published as a collection about writing and about fiction. Um, and I would definitely recommend that. Like, I think her thinking about fiction and, and um, what it, I suppose, our experiences when we read fiction was really interesting to us. She definitely, I think, has a good perspective on the way that fiction can expose us to different lives, you know, give us a window into other experiences than our own. Um, so I definitely found her really, really interesting and I would recommend, yeah, I would absolutely recommend um, reading Ursula K. Le Guin anyway, because she's wonderful. So maybe she sort of spans that. She's obviously a fiction author. She's written lots of novels, but she's also written lots of essays, which um, I think are really very readable. Yeah. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, if that's the only question, I, I will move on unless there's, there's another question. There's one more, excellent. Oh, great, great. <laughs> Let's do it. OK, uh, how did you search for the literature you gave to the participants? You mentioned that both mm. the fiction and the nonfiction was about similar topics. Yeah, it was really, really hard. Um, so. There was a length, you know, so essentially I had five fiction texts and five nonfiction texts. I wanted them to be roughly the same length so that they take, you know, the same roughly number of words, basically. So it's kind of similar. Um, it's easier to find nonfiction because it's a lot easier to find nonfiction, which is freely available, which doesn't have copyright restrictions. So you can just share it. So I probably started more looking for the fiction because I needed texts which I could share with my participants um, legally without copyright issues in the way. I needed them to be short. So these were all short stories. I wasn't going to ask someone to read War and Peace, right? Um, and I needed them to be different. I wanted the fiction to be different genres or different types because my this is another thing you know other research i think would be interesting to look at genre but i was trying to look at a broad range um yeah so it, it it was tricky so i suppose for example i have one horror story um which i came across i think just because i, I like reading short stories at some point and in that horror story i thought okay this is great it's a good length 
it's horror, but it's not too bad because there's also a question about what can I ethically give to my participants, right? Um, actually, you know, I don't think my ethics committee would permit me to give my participants American Psycho or a Clockwork Orange. I think that would be considered traumatic. So this horror story, I thought it's great. So I wrote to the author and asked his permission uh, for copyright purposes if I could use it. And I'm very lucky that he replied yes, because the horror story is about a vampire who lives forever. I found a non-fiction text, which was about the medicine of making people live forever, right, of life extension. So it was a bit of an ad hoc process like that. It was sort of what can I find which is copyright cleared? It, I wanted it all to be different, you know, I, so that's a medicine story. OK, so the next one cannot again be about medicine. It has to be. It has to be a different topic, right? Um, so that was sort of the process. It's definitely not a perfect process. Um, and it, you definitely can't say that these texts are equivalent. If you know what I mean, you know, a horror story about vampires is not the same thing as a article about life extension medicine. Um, but somehow I was trying to create some level of balance. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, I would like to actually follow up with one question mm. myself, uh, speaking about the selection of the fiction pieces. Uh, was there any, were there any other parameters you uh, actually considered? Because I can imagine that, for example, uh, the, if, you know, the difference between uh, whether it's written from first or third person can enhance mm -hmm. empathy differently. So were there any other, um, you know, like <laughs> other considerations what, like this while choosing the, the pieces? Yeah, I mean, we, I thought about it. I'll be honest with you. I think you could write such a list of requirements. It would be like there are so many ways that fiction can be different. It can be really hard. Um, I did try and include something first person and something third person, um, but I didn't get into a lot of, I suppose, depth with that. Um, I will say as well to make it accessible to different kinds of participant. I wasn't choosing um, like maybe I wasn't choosing old English. I was making sure it was all contemporary in language um, and I wasn't choosing anything. I suppose very, um, I don't know, highly convoluted because it creates again a problem because the language of magazine articles is never that complex, if you know what I mean. So I didn't want there to be a just a basic English language comprehension barrier. Um, yeah, but I have to be honest with you, there are many things I could have um, controlled more in what I selected, but it was quite a practical process of what, what I was able to access, what was the suitable length and what I was able to, to share, um, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think there are no more questions for now, so we can proceed with, uh, with the presentation. Lovely. Okay, so, Having done all this measurement, having run an experiment, essentially, um, I then moved into doing the qualitative side of my research and I conducted a series of interviews. Uh, this study is published, so if you're really interested, obviously today you're getting a short version, but this is an open access paper, you can freely read it if you would like to. Um, so the thing is here, you know, some people did two tests, they read some stuff, but I didn't talk to any of those people. I don't know what they thought about, you know, what I'd given them to read these tests they were doing. And even though we can see an effect, I don't know if those nonfiction readers who'd been given these short stories experienced some difference in their critical thinking or as they were reading those short stories, did they think, oh, this is really making me question how other people think or, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's a very simple quantitative study in the sense that there's all this experience that we can't uh, access from that data. So doing some interviews allowed me to build on those findings um, and try and see, okay, well, what 
what do readers feel um, you know their reading might you know do to their critical thinking um, I should foreground this to say this is not the study I plan to do I had a completely different study planned the COVID-19 pandemic happened all my plans went in the bin and I had to very quickly come up with a totally different study so this is me being completely honest that's how this study came to be um, I recruited these people online during the, the COVID-19 lockdown. And I was looking for readers or bookworms. So these are not any old person. Um, so I was looking for people who were members of book clubs primarily, or I was recruiting primarily through public libraries. Um, yeah, so it's important to note that we aren't just talking to the random public here. Um, and they could be fiction or non-fiction readers, but I just wanted them to be people who read a lot. One of the reasons for this is I think actually if you're a person who doesn't really do a lot of reading, doing a couple of really long interviews about reading is probably going to be really boring and not a very nice experience for you. So there's an element of just practicality there as well. Uh, so the study looked like this. There were two interviews. Each interview was about half an hour, maybe sometimes a little bit more. Remember, we're in the pandemic, so it's all happening online. It's all happening through video calls. Um, and in the first interview, we talked generally about what they think about reading and critical thinking overall. In between those two interviews, they read something uh, and this was totally open. I was not influencing this at all I would just ask them at the end of the interview you know do you have something you want to read in the next couple of weeks um, and people could choose whatever it could be a novel it could be a magazine article I mean honestly anything they wanted and then at interview number two we then talked about critical thinking and reading but really reflecting on this text that they had chosen to read and the time window between those two interviews was flexible. Uh, so if you want to read a whole novel, we can obviously have a longer break between the two interviews. If you just want to read a news piece, I could interview you tomorrow if that's what you want. So I was really responding to participants needs to make it really easy for people to take part. Um, hopefully some of you will be familiar with what coding means. What this means is from those two interviews, I had all these transcripts. So those interviews were recorded. They were transcribed at all this text of what people said. And then I went through and coded it, looking for pieces of text, um, you know, on a, that that had some similar characteristics that contained some similar information. That was an enormous process. It was I. I'm a physical kind of person, so it's lots of paper and lots of highlighters. But luckily it was the COVID pandemic, so it's not like I was going to go out anyway. So I just sat at home and coded for weeks. And then these things you're seeing here are the categories of codes. So after I selected all these pieces of text across all these different interviews that were saying something meaningful, that were saying something interesting, these are the kind of categories that we can group them in. Um, well, we can say different things that different people said, but yeah, they fall under this heading. So what you can see is because I was talking to people about their experience of critical thinking, I got some information which was almost what does thinking critically mean to these participants? What do they think it is? Um, and then you can see I had some, the kind of light blue codes here, where people were telling me what they think reading I suppose any kind of reading, all of their reading, how their reading is influencing the ways they think um, and think critically. And then the dark blue text, some people talked specifically about how they think fiction changes the way they think critically. Some people talked about how they think nonfiction changes the way they think critically. The last one here, narrative transportation, I'm not really going to talk about because we haven't covered it, but it's sort of like how you experience being transported into the text so you forget the world around you and you're just in the text. Um, so these were the kinds of things my participants were, were talking to me about. And from that, I can sort of again condense that information under three themes. 
So looking across all my interview transcripts, these are the sort of three, um, yeah, overarching ways of grouping the findings. So firstly, fiction gives experiential, critical thinking, understanding. Um, there was something really important to participants in the way that we experience fiction. Fiction takes us on a journey over time. It's a flow. We are very much in that experience. Um, and there's something about experiencing each step of the journey that participants connected to experiencing each step in thinking critically and going deeply into you know, an idea or a problem. So that, ex that, that kind of fact it's happening over time, it's a flow, it's a journey, that was important and it seemed to link fiction and critical thinking for people. There was a lot about reflection, there was a lot about kind of using your imagination to, to fill in gaps, to make inferences. There was a really interesting element for me here, which was about how fiction can bypass our defences. So. What participants were describing here was, you read this novel and maybe this character presents some ideas that you would totally disagree with in your normal life. But because it's in a novel, that's really different. It's not the same as if you just read a, I don't know, an opinion article in the New York Times that gave you those opinions. There's something about, you know, what we will read in fiction that gets around our kind of feeling of, oh, no, I don't agree, um, which I thought was interesting. And then for us, I think in the library and information science world, where I know we talk a lot about the quality of sources and authors, fiction, you know, when people talked about thinking critically about fiction, they talked about how complicated it is to, um, think about an author's positionality. So what I mean here is if I'm reading a novel um, and I don't know, there's something really sexist that happens in the novel, like a woman is treated really badly in the novel. Does that mean the author is sexist or not? That's a much more complex question than if I read a non-fiction article that says something negative about women, right? Understanding a fiction author's beliefs or worldviews requires maybe more sophisticated critical thinking, or it's certainly, it's just a much more complicated and unclear area. So people thought that was another way that fiction reading could prompt us to think critically and challenge us to think critically. So I thought that was really interesting. Whereas I suppose for me, the sort of things that people were talking about with nonfiction, um, we're probably quite familiar, I think, to us as like librarians. They probably fall much more under what we normally talk about when we talk about evaluating sources and evaluating information. Um, it was about what's the quality of the source. It was very much about separating pieces of information and looking for what is the key information I'm looking for and assessing it alone, which is very, very different, I think, from that kind of journey approach with fiction. But there was also something interesting here with uh, people describing nonfiction reading and critical thinking as like a cycle. You read a piece of nonfiction, you think critically about it, and then the next time you read another piece of nonfiction, maybe you're better prepared for it, you know, like maybe you're building through this process of reading, thinking, reading, thinking, which was seemed quite different to me than how people were talking about fiction and critical thinking. And then there's a kind of whole other theme here, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today because of time, basically, but where we can separate fiction and nonfiction, but there are ways that just reading, just reading anything, just all reading is kind of changing how we think and is changing how we reflect and understand the world. So those were some of the findings from the study. Briefly, I do just want to run through some quotes with you because this was an interview study. I want the participants voice to be present. So this person's illustrating that thing about authors and how we judge the validity of an author. So they're saying, you know, should authors only write about things that they have di direct experience of on some level? Is it legitimate if I were to write a story about an Aboriginal Australian? 
could I put myself in their shoes and write a novel? Would that be appropriate? These are the kinds of questions that people are asking about a fiction author, which I think are really interesting and very different to where the ways we might judge the validity of a nonfiction author. This is a really long quote, but it's sort of giving you the sense of how fiction and nonfiction happen in a different time. So this person's talking about a book that, full disclosure, I really hate this novel, but as a researcher, you know, you have to come in with an open mind. So she's talking about Room by Emma Donoghue. Um, and she says, you know, when you see news stories, it's the aftermath. It's a revision of what's happened and it's never as it's happening. Whereas this novel, Room, she says um, it looks at the experiences. It, um, it's more of a human story. You get the struggle. Um, so she's making this difference between the experience the novel takes you on, which is all the way through time. It's all the way through everything that happens to those people versus a new story, which is happening at the end. And it's summarizing events at the end. And I thought that time difference was interesting. This person's talking a bit about that thing I said about bypassing our defenses, right? Um, maybe it's a good, so by reading, maybe we can kind of practice our critical thinking. We can practice being open to different points of view um, because it's safe. Like if in the pub, somebody says something you disagree with, you might want to avoid an aggressive, loud argument, which could be really uncomfortable. So you you might want to just avoid hearing opinions different to your own. Um, but if you're reading a novel, they say, and you disagree with, with the author's argument, well, that's not nearly as uncomfortable. So there's something there about the kind of safety and the way we can, we can engage with opinions in text that is different to real life. Anyway, this study also obviously has limitations. Um, it's a small sample, I interviewed 12 people. They were interviewed online. This was during the pandemic. It does mean only certain kinds of people taking part. Um, and we have to remember, I was actively asking people about reading and critical thinking. They didn't spontaneously, oh sorry, they didn't spontaneously make that connection. They were asked to make that connection. So I'm just checking time and I realize that I want to make sure we can have a good discussion. I'm gonna flag to you that there was another qualitative study I told you I did too much research. It was too much. I also got people to keep some diaries. Um, I'm not going to talk about them today because it would be very long. Um, but I am going to just very briefly finish with a little bit of kind of, I suppose, maybe where I might be going with this, what I think it might mean. And I'd definitely be interested to hear your views. So firstly, just to reiterate, I think hopefully we can all agree that critical thinking is important. Um, lots of people think it's necessary for us to live in a kind of good democratic society. Um, there's the argument I made at the beginning that absolutely anyone can think critically. So it's something kind of egalitarian about it. Um, and we should also remember that critical thinking uh, which I didn't talk about my daily diary study, but critical thinking happens daily, right? You can think critically about, um, I don't know, which toaster to buy, or the, right? But you can also think really critically about the meaning of life. There's a kind of sliding scale of critical thinking. So I think we should kind of treat it importantly and think about how it can be developed. My research certainly suggests that reading fiction can help us perhaps build our critical thinking. Um, in my pilot, you know, people who were exposed to more fiction also seem to be more disposed to think critically. In my experimental study, people who consider themselves to be non-fiction readers seem to benefit from being given fiction to read. Their test scores improved over a two week period on critical thinking. And when you speak to people about reading and critical thinking, they are describing lots of different ways that these might be connected and how reading different kinds of material might shape and shift the ways we think critically with distinctions between how fiction and nonfiction could be doing that. Um, 
So this basically leads me to argue that we should be treating fiction as important. Um, I think, you know, I don't know again about the Czech context, the British uh, kind of political context around education um, has been very strongly centered around STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, maths, around those being important uh, and in some ways the arts and humanities um, have been devalued. They've certainly been defunded. Lots of uh, universities have been closing um, kind of departments within the arts and humanities because they don't have sufficient funding. Um, so, you know, if we're saying that something like fiction, which is obviously very firmly of the arts and humanities family, could be benefiting our critical thinking, maybe we need to rethink kind of educationally how we value um, different forms of education. Um, and I think for us, you know, if, if anybody's working as a librarian, if anybody's involved in information literacy instruction, I don't think we normally talk about fiction. I think in my experience, we talk about, you know, why is a journal article different from a newspaper article or why is information in a book better or worse or different than information in a blog? There's something here about what about fiction? You know, what is the role of, of a much more um, maybe subtle kind of development of our critical thinking that as librarians, I think it's interesting for us to think more about. And uh, again, I, I'd be really interested to hear about the Czech context. Um, in the UK, in Britain, public libraries are closing continuously. Um, it's something the government has been underfunding for many, many years now. And this obviously restricts, I suppose, the access to fiction material to um, a lot of people in society. And I think that is potentially a problem. Um, and I suppose within the world of public libraries, like if you work in the public library, one of the things that I think is interesting in my findings is I was not just talking to people about, you know, Shakespeare. We were not talking just about literature, literary fiction, sophisticated, respected texts. A lot of the examples that people were giving both in the diary, but also in the interviews were romance novels. Um, Terry Pratchett was talked about a lot by my interviewees. Just kind of fiction that I suppose a lot of us might look at as, you know, pulp or as kind of not very sophisticated. Um, but actually that I think has a has a value and it has a role and maybe we need to think about that. Um, and I think there's something about serendipity or chance. So a lot of what my participants in those interviews were talking about is reading something that takes you out of your normal experience, that remember it bypasses your defenses, it exposes you to other points of view. I think there's something there about the public library where you look at some shelves and there's all these different books and you sort of pick something and because you don't have to pay money for it, maybe you think I'm just gonna take a chance and read this book that I don't know anything about. And I think there might be a kind of special value to that, that the public library can offer. Um, and that, I might leave it on the nice public library slide, there's a whole slide of references, but that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I realise that my room is now very, very dark. I'm going to pause for a minute. I'm going to go and put the lights on while you get ready with your questions. And I hope to hear your questions in just a second. Now my lights are on. Hopefully you can actually see me. Um, and yes, I hope nice somebody room. has questions. Oh, I, our room is very dark too. But <laughs> uh, OK, there is one question in chat. Uh, I will read it. You have concluded that information literacy and critical thinking are linked. Does this mean that information literacy improves critical thinking and the, the other way around? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, strictly speaking, I can't answer that question because I didn't test that, 
Um, you know, none of my studies actually measured information literacy. I was only measuring critical thinking. But going from the literature, um, the way that people talk about information literacy and the way that people talk about critical thinking and what those mean. I mean, in my view, sort of yes, in the sense that I think while we might be talking about really different basic skills, what we are trying to build with those skills, I think is ultimately the same sort of thing. So if we spend lots of time, you know, training our library users, um, how to evaluate the quality of a source or, you know, whatever it might be, I think what we want to develop in them is kind of the same thing as if in a classroom I'm trying to teach critical thinking and I'm trying to give students like examples of arguments, I'm trying to get them to assess those arguments. So I sort of think it's almost like information literacy and critical thinking are different things we can practice and build, but they're hopefully like improving the same core set of abilities, um, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, uh, we are still waiting for more questions. So I would like to ask you, uh, that's actually something what came to my mind right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, if we talk about fiction, uh, do we really consider just reading? Because there are different types of fiction and I'm not talking just movies or plays but also games or let's say interactive fiction because I know there are studies uh, especially about interactive fiction pieces that uh, kind of prove that uh, they really enhance empathy and other uh, other values like that so um, why have you focused just on books and maybe second question uh, do you think that these results may apply also to other types of fiction, not just books? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, one answer is that in a PhD study, you can't do everything and you sort of have to make some decisions about I'm going to research A, but I'm not going to look at B because it becomes impossible to, to conduct the research. So there's, there's a practical element. Um, I so I didn't kind of define it at the beginning, but I had a sort of definition of fiction that was around text. I did include audiobooks. So, um, you know, whether you read, uh, you know, A Clockwork Orange in a, in a paper novel or whether you listen to it, I sort of counted that as the same thing. Um, I didn't include kind of movies, TV shows, um, visual, I suppose, fiction, because there is some literature that really shows differences, like quite strong differences in the effects of reading and watching. Um, so for the purposes of my PhD study, I just looked at reading. I think the questions of interactive fiction, so kind of the games area, is a lot more complex. Um, I've seen some of that literature. I have to admit, I'm not that familiar with it. I, yeah, I suspect while I while I am aware that there are some really big differences in watching and reading, um, I think games might be a sort of strange in between place. And I would tentatively predict, like my expectation would be that yes, I think interactive fiction probably would have the same effects. Um, but of course, I didn't measure it and I didn't study it. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, like the reality of being a researcher, like it's my daily job, is that you just have to make decisions about this is interesting, but we can't do it. Um, that's a kind of daily part of my work as a researcher, unfortunately. Um, but if anybody out there wants to study interactive fiction and critical thinking, I would love to read your research. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, I can see there's one hand up. Daniela wants to ask a question. So Daniela, if you can hear me, uh, floor is yours. You can ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for this lecture. 
uh, and I would like to encourage you to publish your study as soon as possible because uh, it would be an interesting impetus for a change in at least some dimension of education. And one question I would like to ask you is if you believe, I understand that it's not uh, a, par a part of your study, but if you believe that overconsumption of fiction could also lead to a negative sort of critical thinking where uh, where the individual starts, uh, let's say, questioning the reality to the point that they are less receptive to generally considered truths in sciences and in any other uh, dimension. That's a That's really question. interesting question. Firstly, thank you for the encouragement. Um, literally, my Christmas project is to write my journal article about the reading log study, so hopefully that will be published. Um, is too much fiction bad for you? In my pilot study, you might remember I talked about epistemological orientation, which is silly researcher language for what do we believe about truth? And you might remember I said in in the literature, in the way that's measured, there's usually three sort of categories. You're an absolutist if you believe things are true or they're false. You're a multiplist if you believe there is no truth, there is no falsehood. You know, we all have our own reality. And somewhere in the middle, you can be an evaluativist, which is where you feel that we must evaluate on a case by case basis and somehow truth and falsehood is maybe a bit more gray. These are really obviously rough categories. I don't think real humans fit perfectly in those boxes, right? But in my first study, I did look at that. And essentially what I was seeing was that nonfiction readers were more likely to be absolutist. And fiction readers were very, very unlikely to be absolutist. They would either be evaluativist or they could be multiplist, but they really were not absolutist. Let's put it that way. So maybe that points a little bit to what you're saying, that if you read fiction a lot, maybe your sense of things being true or false is, is it's less likely to be absolute. I doesn't that study doesn't allow me to say, oh, it might make you really multiplist that study. You know, it has limitations. I can't go that far. I suspect we might have really that might be an area where it might be the case, but it, it there might be genre differences. You know, some fiction is very much of the real world, right? It's very um, accurate to reality. It's just that, you know, it's a story of a particular life inside. A reality that's that's very much true. You know, to the world, other kinds of fiction, you know, obviously science fiction and fantasy. Shift that more or less, so. I can imagine a scenario where somebody reads nothing but fantasy novels and maybe is a bit more multiplist and maybe, you know, is kind of a little bit more disconnected from. Reality in some way. Um, yeah, I suppose like I can I can see that, but I think it I, I would predict there would be genre differences. I guess I don't see it so much if you're reading lots of like. I don't know, realistic literature, I guess I don't see a reason why. That might alter your kind of sense of true and false as much. Um, but this is speculation. I didn't study it, unfortunately. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, hi, uh, I want to. I have one question for Mrs. Horis. Uh, uh, I think uh, I'm very interested in this area of research uh, about fiction and information science. And uh, I think that uh, the question is, uh, do you think that uh, this area, fiction and information, is under research in, in the area of information science and the librarianship? Because 
I, uh, I do some research and uh, many papers was about uh, knowledge organization of fiction, mainly in Finland and Denmark, but about uh, information behavior uh, uh, in context of uh, fiction reading, there are very small uh, small number of studies. Uh, only studies which I found was uh, your, your study about critical thinking, and I think it's a very interesting topic and important because we live our lives uh, in fiction world all the time, and I'm very, very uh, I think that it's a it's a weird that uh, in information sciences doesn't do this this uh, research. Uh, I think maybe one hypothesis, which is my hypothesis, only my hypothesis, is that it, it maybe we can connect it with the uh, two culture concept uh, uh, from PRC Snow, which wrote some paper about it in in 50s in British uh, context. That there are, and maybe you mentioned it, that, that there are some hard scientists, physician, and so on. And on the other side are, are uh, literature and uh, this uh, soft sciences, maybe. Uh, uh, what do you think about it? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, oh. great. That's no, so a really good question. So question one, is it underrepresented, I suppose, in information studies? I'm obviously biased because I think it's interesting. My answer is yes, I think it is underrepresented in our field. I would agree with you what you're saying about the literature, what you were finding and what you were not finding sounds very similar to my experience. I have seen studies which are around like in public libraries, what kind of people read what kind of books, if you know what I mean. Um, so actually the person who, so one of the reasons I'm fairly confident when I say I think it's understudied is I had a really difficult job finding a PhD examiner. It was very difficult to find somebody who could examine me in my thesis because there just are very few people working in this field who are looking at fiction. Um, Bryony Birdie from Sheffield examined me, but her research has a lot more to do with, you know, if you have a public library, do, let's say, ethnic minority people read? Are they more likely to read novels by ethnic minority authors, right? Like, are there kind of groups of people who read different things? It's more descriptive, if you if you get my kind of direction with that. Um, I've also seen some literature on like librarians perceptions. So stuff around like librarians thinking that romance isn't very good and they don't want it in their library, basically. Um, which from my research, I would disagree with. But anyway, so I agree. I think it's an un, it, it, it's a, I think fiction is something that we as library and information professionals should be thinking more about. And researching more. And then the other part of this about this kind of humanities and science distinction. Um, I actually ended up writing about it in my thesis. It's somewhere in my introduction. Off the top of my head, I'm going to struggle to remember the authors who I want to remember. Part of my argument with my research is that I think that dichotomy is kind of problematic because I think what we do in the humanities to build our critical thinking applies to the ways we might think critically about hard science information. Yeah, I don't think that these are bubbles that live independently. I don't think they're completely different modes of thinking and understanding the world. Um, I think it's a bit of an arbitrary line that people draw, is, that's my view. Um, there's an author called Jerome Brunner who writes a lot about narrative and paradigmatic thinking. So he makes this difference between narrative or kind of fictional ways of thinking, which he thinks are completely separate and different to paradigmatic thinking, which he thinks is sort of scientific. Um, and I basically disagree with everything he has to say about that. I don't think we can put those in different boxes. I think what's happening is our narrative thinking is part of how we think scientifically. Um, the author I'm trying to remember the name of, and I can have a look for you in a minute if you're interested in, 
but there are many scientists you know physicists i'm thinking of a particular physicist whose name hopefully will come to me who have written about how much scientific thinking is about storytelling um in some ways you know there are kind of fictional ways of understanding scientific truths if you will um so i think there's a lot of people who would challenge that dichotomy and i'm definitely one of them and i can have a little look for this physicist's name while the next person maybe asks a question because it's somewhere i've got my other computer i've got my literature review it's here somewhere um i can find it for you But anyway, in the meantime, somebody else, please ask a question while I look for this citation. Are there any more questions? You can just write them to chat or just ask a list. I'm not Maybe. finding this. Sorry. Please go. I'm, sorry, I'm not um, can finding I ask a citation. A question? I might tell you later, but please, yeah, ask a question. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, what are your future research plans, or what are you currently working on? Yeah, sure. So I'm, um, you know, a little bit sadly, maybe I'm not a librarian anymore. I'm not in a library and information sciences department. I'm not actually in a university at all. Um. I'm working at an independent research institute and we do project work. So what that means is different people commission us to do different kinds of research. Um, what's lovely about that is I get to do lots of different projects. Um, it also means that it's a little bit harder to kind of have an overall research direction, I suppose. And maybe in some ways I miss that. Um, and I'm not really necessarily in charge of kind of designing research projects because we're being commissioned by people who have research interests. Um, yeah, so I'm just working in a, in a really different research context at the moment. Um, some of the key things I'm interested in is, I suppose, broadening who gets to do research. Um, certainly in the UK, you know, research is held kind of in university structures. Um, funding to do research is very much tied to being in academic contexts. Um, but there's really interesting research work kind of happening in odd like community groups and organizations and people sort of coming together to understand something, to understand issues that they face. So I'm really interested in that. Maybe that's the little bit of my kind of public library motivation coming through there. I, I suppose I have this interest in how how can everyone be able to do research and how can we fund that? Um, so that's a kind of ongoing piece of work um, that I'm that I'm involved with here. Um, yeah, and my other research, I mentioned at the beginning, I've been doing this work on what does social infrastructure mean? Um, our political situation in the UK is a bit crazy. I don't know if that's been in your news, but it's been however many prime ministers and it's been chaos, but there's a sort of central, I suppose, agreement across political parties that the United Kingdom has a problem with, um, depending on where you live, what you have access to, what your quality of life is going to be, what kind of education you're going to get is really different. Um, if you live in London, you definitely have access to a public library. If you don't live in London, whether or not you have access to a public library depends on how wealthy the area you live in is the reality of it. And in the United Kingdom, as you go north, but before Scotland, because Scotland's very different, but in England, as you go north, roughly speaking, things get worse. Um, as you go southeast, roughly things get better. And as you go west, stuff gets worse again. Yeah, this is a massive generalization. So one of the pieces of research I'm looking at is like, how can we start to fix that? What are the key things that you know you almost have to have in your community for you to be able to have the education, the kind of lifestyle, the sort of ability to, um, yeah, to, to kind of 
live the life you want to live, I suppose. Um, what, are, what are the almost minimum things that your town or your village or your neighbourhood has to have? So that's a piece of research I'm doing. It's bigger than libraries, but in my view, libraries are definitely part of it. Um, I think we can definitely say that in the UK, you know, wealthier places are more likely to have libraries, poorer places are less likely to have libraries, and places that do have libraries are bet likelier to have, I suppose, better social conditions, better educational outcomes for sure. Um, yeah, and we just, we do have a really massive kind of inequality problem. So there's a kind of big amount of research that I'm engaged with there that we hope will help inform policy in some ways. So it's a very waffly answer. Um, So I think we have time for one last question. OK, there is one in chat. That's interesting. Do you think crowdfunding could work for citizen research? It seems there are some limits to the topics being researched because only popular topics would get funding. Um, that's a really good question. In, fu in a funny way, I think yeah, so I'm not sure about crowdfunding because I think, well, I suppose the work that I've been looking at is um, in the UK, research funding, so it's primarily tax money that goes to a kind of central way of funding research. That money is basically just being given to academic institutions to do research. Because it's tax money, it's our money like in a way you could argue that that is crowdfunding anyway like that money has come from everybody but only but you know you have to be in a particular context to be able to get that money to do research as i was just mentioning we also have a problem in the uk um that not all the universities realistically get as much funding it's something incredibly shocking, like 80%, like 80% of research funding is coming to the southeast of England. So universities in London, obviously Oxford, Cambridge, yeah, these universities get lots of research money. The universities in the north, York, Nottingham and others, which can be, you know, excellent, are, are basically getting less money. But it's it's it is sort of crowdfunding, it's tax money. So maybe there's a problem there. So I suppose my focus has been more on how do we fix that? How do we make that more fair? My concern with efforts like let's start a GoFundMe or whatever to kick a research project off and everybody can donate like five pounds and we do this research together. I think that's great. I think it can work. But my concern is that that shouldn't be how it has to be done. Um, actually, I think the responsibility is with um, the government because it's tax money and it's with the organisations that distribute the money. Um, like, I think they need to do a better job. And the sort of crowdfunding or other sources are kind of a nice extra, um, but they're not a replacement for the, the, the enormous kind of powerful institutional money that is being spent on research, but it's being spent in particular places for particular people to do particular kinds of research. If you're interested about this, actually, we've got a paper that I can find for you, um, which I can post in the chat. I don't know if somebody wants to sneak in a final question while I do this. Okay, so last chance for, for asking more questions. No, there's no question. Anyway, I don't think you can access the chat. Oh, I can't. <laughs> um, okay, so I promised you two references. I promised you one to this physicist who has a whole book about how fiction a narrative narrative is important for scientific thinking and the other one i've promised you is how do we make research funding more equitable i will send both of those links to christina and she can send them to you 
Uh, because I have to find them. I have them somewhere. I'm just very bad at finding the right reference. And my memory for names is shocking. So my ability to remember an author's name is really bad, which when you work as a librarian is a bit embarrassing, actually. But unfortunately, that is the case. Okay, so we are um, we are out of time. So I would like to thank you so much for uh, giving us this uh, brief <laughs> overview of your work and for uncovering this interesting uh, and unstudied topic for us. Uh, I personally believe that I have way more question about the topic <laughs> than I had at the beginning, which which is a good thing. But um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much again. And uh, I hope that. Uh, oh yeah, there is one more. I'm sorry, there is one more contribution. Let's in the do chat. It, that's fine. Uh, yeah, Dalibor is writing. Uh, I really like what Alexei Guzay does in the new science project with funding individual researches instead of particular project. And he writes a link, he sends a link, which I can share with you later since you cannot see it. But uh, thank you for that, Dalibor. Thank you. All right, so, uh, so that's it. So thank you so much again and uh, good luck in your research. And hopefully you will get a chance to continue, continue working with yeah, well, this topic. Thank you so much to everyone who came today. Thank you for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure and you've definitely given me a bit of motivation to finally do some writing on this. So thank you for that too. Um, I should have also said um, your lecturer's got my contact information. If anybody wants to email me questions, um, Christina, I'm very happy for you to share my email address. It's available online anyway. If you Google me, Institute for Community Studies, Helena Hollis, you'll find me. Um, but yeah, please do ping me email questions if anybody has any. I'll be happy to try and answer. Um, yeah, 